Well, good morning, family. God bless you. It's good to be here on this first Sunday of November. And we indeed always pray that all is well with you and your family. To God be the glory. He's watched over us since the month of March and has brought us to this point. And we give him all the glory and the praise for keeping us and watching over us. Now, we're getting ready to go right into perfecting class. Some of you, you've had an extra hour to prepare, so I know you're here on time. We do love you, family, and we do pray God's blessing upon this lesson. Our scriptural lesson text will be coming from the book of Exodus, chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. The title of our lesson is The People Sin Against God. Golden text, and they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. And this is Psalms 9 and verse 10. Now the aim of our lesson is to see clearly that sin is offensive to God. The principle is to understand how God responds to the sins of his people. And the application is to anticipate God's response to our own sin and what we need to do about it. So let's go right into our scriptural lesson text. Exodus 32, beginning at verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Verse 2. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graven tool. And after he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made the proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them, and they have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thy own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And verse 14, And the Lord repented of the evil, which he thought to do unto his people. Wow. So this is an interesting lesson. You've heard pastor teach and preach on this lesson before. 
I said, basically, I titled my subject for this lesson, what do you do in the meantime? In the meantime, they're waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain. He delayed to come down. He's been out there for 40 some plus days and nights. And the people have become a little bit uh, impatient. And so they just say, we, they don't know what has happened to Moses. So one of the things a lot of us have to consider and watch out for is that time called meantime. It's that in-between time. And when we think about even the season that we're going through, uh, this is going a lot longer than a lot of people anticipated. So we have to reassure ourselves that even in the, during the meantime that we're going through, in between phase, that space that's in between uh, your prayers being asked and your prayers being answered, we have to realize that God is still in control and he has a plan. And we can't become discouraged. We can't give up just because it's taking a little bit longer than what we had planned. So here's where we're going to start. As we look at Moses, Moses is up. He's interceding for Israel. He's, he's receiving God's uh, commandments. And the people have become impatient. And the first thing they tell they want Aaron to do is they want Aaron to, to take charge, you know, uh, Moses' absence. They said to Aaron, get up, make us some gods. Because we don't know what has happened, what has become of this man called Moses. So after waiting for 40 days, they had given up on seeing him return to them. And they went to Aaron with this request. Make us a god. Or make us gods. Isn't that interesting? I don't know about you. As I said from time to time. I don't want any god that I can make. I don't want any god that supposedly will take care of me that I can carry. I don't want to have a god that I can carry. I want a god that can carry me. You know, I don't want a god that I have to take care of and and make sure that he doesn't rest or whatever. And, and you think about just the just the you know the concept of trying to have something replace the true and living God. So we understand that uh, Aaron is is here, uh, basically the spokesman. He's been left in charge, and these people put a very very unique request out uh, to Aaron for what to do. Now, it might sound like their request was kind of shocking, but, but Moses, their servant, whom they had put or placed some misguided trust, they were, they were focusing on Moses more so than focusing on God. So they were kind of attributing Moses to being the reason or the one who seemed to be helping them to get out of Egypt and, and experience all the miracles and things, but they don't realize that Moses is just a servant. It was God who was working through Moses that was making a difference. So their eyes have, are really placed upon a man when they should have been placed solely upon God himself. Now, with this request from the people, it's kind of surprising when we look at the scripture. It looks like there is very little uh, resistance on the part of Aaron. Because verse 2 says, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in their, your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them unto me. So it doesn't seem like Aaron at all is resisting or, or giving them uh, a reason to, to, to think about what they're requesting. He simply, it looks like immediately says, Okay, here's what we're going to do. Bring me your earrings real quickly. You know, there's no indication where he actually objected to what the people were asking. So you have to realize that. So sometimes it's easy to serve leaders or to serve a leader, but sometimes when you are left in charge, when you stand alone for the truth, the pressures are there in order to cause people to compromise greatly, to surrender, or even to remain silent. You know, Aaron was doing good as long as Moses was there, but now in Moses' absence, he gets a taste of the pressure, and he gets a, uh, an, an opportunity to make the right decision, but it seems like he just gave in so easily to the people. 
Now, obviously, you know, you're looking at about 2 million uh, or more people. So those who were there didn't all speak. They obviously had uh, spokesmen, people who represented them and who spoke on behalf of their interests. Now, we don't know specifically the number who, who made this request. Uh, Exodus 32, 28 indicates that there were about 3,000 men that died as a result of this idolatry in the camp. But however, whatever the size was, one thing we do know is this, is that it was enough to intimidate Aaron. It was enough to make him give in and give the people instructions about breaking off their earrings so that he can he can he can make this or fashion this this uh, God that they're requesting. So the Bible says that they begin to break off their earrings and, and, and Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and formed it into the image of a calf. All right. And this, this probably was something that he did. He probably made a, a wooden frame of a calf and then was able to pour the gold within, the, within that frame to get this image. Now we see here something very interesting is that once he made the calf, Aaron made a proclamation. He said he, the idea of this calf is clearly seen as he says, these be the gods, O Israel which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And this could be translated as singular. This is your God. So there's an understanding that makes sense. That Aaron built an altar and declared the next day a feast to the Lord Yahweh. Now it appears that both Aaron and the people were trying to justify their actions by declaring this idol to be a representation of the true God. So they were actually trying to make this calf a physical, actual, tangible representation of their God. But we all know if those who seek to worship God must worship him as he has prescribed. You can't make something in the image or of a calf and say that this is God or this represents God because they needed something physical to touch. Remember, the world teaches us that God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So they were kind of misguided here in their concept. They, again, needed or wanted something physical that they can receive and touch for their worship. Now, the Bible says this, that the following day, the people rose up early to present offerings on the altar before the golden outer. They feasted. And they rose up to play. Now that term, rose up to play, uh, often refers or implies some immoral activity. They were associated with trying to worship God, but somehow they're eating and they're drinking, and there's some immoral activity going on. All right? So you have to keep that in mind. Everything they were doing, it, it was not some type of holiness there was um, a, uh, a, a, a diversion of, of uh, immorality that crept in. So the Lord is observing everything. He knows everything that's going on. Moses is totally unaware. But look at the Lord's response as he informed Moses. Here Moses is still on the mountain. He had been isolated from the people for 40 days as he met with the Lord. He did not know what was going on in the camp below, but the Lord knew. And of course, he told Moses to get back down to the people, informing him that they had corrupted themselves. And you know something what God told Moses? He said, Moses, he said very uh, specifically, God said, Moses, I want you to go back down because why? Thy people, get thee down, verse 7, for thy people which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. It's almost like God was saying, Moses, those are your people. Uh, you the one brought them out. Th th those are your people. It's almost like God was disappointed in having them represent him as his children. He was disappointed in them. He said, Moses, your people, which you brought out of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. And the Lord was 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 really disappointed in this special people that he had chosen that how quick 
after declaring their allegiance to God, look at how quick they turn away from his commands. So you can see how quickly people can say one thing with their mouth, make allegiance to God in a certain way, but with their actions, they can declare truly what's in their heart. So we see here where God told Moses, go down there, those are your people, which you brought out of Egypt, and they have corrupted themselves. So God is speaking to Moses, and we see something. We see here in Exodus 32, 9 through 10, where as God speaks to Moses, God refers to the people as being stiff-necked. This frequently, you know, is a term used to describe the pictures when you think of uh, a horse that stiffens his neck against the reins, resisting the rider's direction. And the Lord then presented an astonishing proposal. Now listen to this. He said, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them. And he would then start over by making from Moses a great nation. Now we see that God is telling Moses, just leave me alone. Let me do what I want to do to these people. And we can start fresh with a nation, Moses, that comes specifically from you. Now we know as we read the story of Noah that God does not have any problems with starting over. But some think that this was a test that God was putting Moses through to see how he would respond. And the question was this, would Moses uh, be a caring shepherd, a caring leader for the people? Or would he, you know, basically abandon the people for self-serving purposes? After all, God says, I'll bring the nation through you, Moses. I can forget the rest of these people. But we see here that Moses had a shepherd's heart. We see here that Moses was a leader who cared more about the people and the sheep. And there's some theologians again stating that God was using this as an opportunity to test Moses and see how Moses would respond. And look what Moses did. Here he gave the Lord three reasons why he should not destroy these individuals. First, Moses reminded the Lord that the people belonged to him. Moses took the people and gave them right back to God. God said, Moses, those are your people that you brought up. Moses says, no, Lord. He, in, this, in, in Moses' rebuttal, he's telling God, Lord, these are your people. They belong to you. So the Lord took Israel and he put them right back into God's hands. He reversed it. And he kept saying, oh, Lord, these are your people. I'm giving them back to you. You can't give them to me, Lord. They are literally your people people. So Moses gave personal ownership of the people back to God. That was number one. Secondly, Moses appealed to the basis of the Lord's honor. Were he to destroy the people? He said, Lord, if you destroy all these people, the Egyptians would mark both him and the Israelites. The, just, the Egyptians would have a party. They would declare that even though they were unable to deny God's power, they could say that God's character brought these people out just to kill them, just to slay them in the desert. So this says, oh, God has a, a vengeance type character. So Moses said, not only, first of all, are these your people, but secondly, Lord, if we kill all these people and desert, the, then the Egyptians will have a right to simply say that even though they couldn't stop your power from getting them out, you didn't have enough power or, or, your, or to bring them into the promised land that you had, had, had sought to bring these people into. And thirdly, Moses' strongest argument was that in destroying the people, God would literally violate his own promise to Abraham and Isaac and Israel. The Lord had promised to make from them a great nation with many descendants who would be given a land forever. That's in Genesis 12 and 2. So to annihilate them and start over, making a great nation out of just Moses would contradict God's oath. God had a promise with Abraham. 
And God had a promise through him and Isaac that he would bring bring a nation, a people, through Abraham. And he could swear by no one else. He swore by himself. So Moses said, number one, first of all, these are your people, Lord. You're the one who brought them out. You're the one who delivered them. Secondly, Lord, if you destroy these people, if the Egyptians would have something to brag about, a mark that you didn't have the power or you lacked the character to even de deliver your people. And thirdly, Father, the strongest argument going is that you made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Israel, and thinking that, listen, you will raise up a nation through Abraham's seed, that will be multiplied upon the face of the earth and will inherit the land that you had for them. So here are my three reasons, Lord, why you, I can't get out the way. I can't just leave you alone and allow you to destroy these people. So here's an interesting point that I want you to understand because this is a very, very, very interesting verse. It says something very powerful. So after Moses had pleaded his case, and has shared his point with God. You look at in verse 14, our very final verse. It said, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So some people look at that and says, Well, you see, uh, God repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. God can always change his actions, but he doesn't change his mind. So literally the word should be God relented. And to relent does not mean that God has changed his mind. But it really means that simply that God embarked upon another course of action. And we see that sometimes. We see that. Remember when Jonah uh, reached the, time, um, the town of Nineveh and prayed? And he prayed and he actually gave a sermon on behalf of the people and the whole city took Jonah serious, and they repented. God was going to destroy Nineveh, but they repented. And, and, and they changed, and they turned. And as a result of their turning and changing, God did not destroy the city of, city of Nineveh. All right? So it literally means that not that God changed his mind, but that God embarked upon a course, an, of a different course of action. And we need to always keep that in mind. God can, can embark upon a different choice of action. And the word is nahum. It is relief or comfort from, from a planned, undesirable course or action. It's relief, again, or comfort from a planned, undesirable course of action. So here we go. We see where God... Listen to Moses as Moses intervened on behalf of the people. We see that God told Moses, and many theologians again think this was a test to see what Moses' response would be. Obviously, Moses passed the test. He intervened on behalf of God's people. He, he showed that he surely had a shepherd's heart for the people of God. And God did not change his mind but changed his course of action against the people. So we can see, family, it's not that hard, even though whatever status you might be in, like Aaron, to give in to pressure, to give in to, to the demands, to compromise. And here we see sometimes we have to be very careful because, you know, as pastor said time and time again, God does not always operate on our time schedule. And when we think about even this season that we're in, you know, what we do in the meantime is so, so important. What we do during the time of waiting for uh, the cases to, to subside, during a time of waiting for some vaccine and, and uh, waiting for, for, for God to intervene we have to be very careful to realize that a lot of times our, our faith will be tried and it's through the patience of learning how to wait faithfully on the Lord and trust God. Even though his time schedule doesn't always 
come up to, to what we desire. And a lot of times, it might go a little longer than we intended. We still have the assurance and confidence that God is in control and we can wait patiently on Him. And we won't compromise or do anything out of character, but trust our Heavenly Father. Scripture throughout all the scripture teaches us wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and wait on the Lord. God will come through. God will come through. He will come through for you. So, family, let's stay the course. Let's keep our eyes focused on the Lord uh, and continue to trust Him. And in due season, we're going to reap. In due season, we're going to receive. In due season, we're going to get everything that God has for us if we faint not. So to God be the glory and honor and praise. Uh, we love you. And, and we pray that God's blessing will continue to be with you and upon you. So let's not get impatient again. And don't ch exchange God for something else that you can physically touch or see or feel. Keep God in his rightful place, and that is he must be first in our lives. Honor him in all that you do, and watch God uh, bless and, and, and show himself strong on your behalf. God bless you. God keep is our prayer, and I pray that you've enjoyed this perfecting class for this first Sunday of November of 2020. All the honor and glory belongs to our Heavenly Father. God bless you.